And the first thing people will say is, well, you don't know what I do every day. It's hard for me to stick to a schedule. Like I map out my schedule and I show people that and I show them to show them that I practice what I preach. But if something happens today during, during, you know, let's say I've got a certain time that I'm supposed to be doing something. I'm supposed to be prospecting. Either I'm going to be a disciple to that time or not. Either I'm going to be disciplined to that time or I'm not. What if something comes up and there's an issue to deal with? In my world, here's what I say. I'm not dealing with that issue until 11 o'clock because from 9 to 11, I'm supposed to be doing this one thing. Does that make sense? Now, if it's a huge issue and my most expensive client calls in and says, I want you to deal with this, common sense steps in. Let me deal with this problem and let me go back to what? Doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing because I'm committed. All right, everybody see the difference here? So when we talk about extreme ownership today, I, I want to I get you in the mind frame of, of, there was a book written about this called Extreme Ownership. Jocko Willick wrote the book, and he was a, you know, Navy SEAL or in that line, and basically he went out, he went out to, to do a mission, and many of his men got killed. And they came in and asked him what happened, and he took total responsibility for it. And his commander even said to him, well, so-and-so messed up, so-and-so messed up, and so-and-so messed up. And he said, yeah, they did. But those are people under my leadership. So I'm taking total ownership of the failure of this mission. Everybody understand what I'm saying? Many times total ownership means even when somebody underneath you screws up, it's still your fault. When I was a basketball coach at Riverdale, I used to go over and watch the uh, football. We had a very famous football coach who won a lot of championships, and he would break down film and I wanted to go over there and see how he broke down the film. So we went over there and uh, when a player, this was when a high school player made a mistake, he would blame the coach in front of the kids. Now, what you think about that? The whole team's watching. I saw you grimace when I did that. Let me tell you why. I actually believe that. The kid would make a mistake and he would say, did you miss that block? And he said, yes. He'd say, it's not your fault. It's your coach's fault. Because if your coach taught you how to block right like he's supposed to, you wouldn't miss that block. Who was it, is it right? That kid's just 14, 15 years old. He had been, not been trained properly in how to do it correctly. And you should see those grown men, like when he would call them out like that, those grown men are like, you know, that kid will never miss a block the rest of his time here at Riverdale. I mean, he would hold the coaches accountable. And the coaches would do a better job coaching the kids to make sure they were trained which is why he won, I don't know, four, five, six championships. The coaches were in total ownership of that kid's performance. Does that, does that make sense? Because he was just saying, man, the kid's 16 years old. He's going to make mistakes. He's going to screw up. you got to do a good job of making sure he doesn't do that. So when you're thinking about extreme ownership, sometimes people don't do things, and we'll talk about this today, on your team because they're confused because you as a leader have done a poor job of making it clear on what they should do and testing them and holding them accountable to what you taught them to do. Does that make sense? Because it's one thing, and we're going to get into this, that there's a difference between information, me exposing you to some information, and me training you with repetition and then testing you on what I've trained you on. Everybody see that? And just look at the military. They train and test. They train and test. They train and test. They train and test. So. I was in Las Vegas not long ago and I was speaking to real estate agents and at the end of my couple hour presentation I make a pitch and the pitch is to purchase my online academy for $697. They can get the online academy forever, for life, for $697. But many of the agents wouldn't buy it. They'd say it was great training, they'd say they got coached, they'd say they enjoyed it, but at the end they wouldn't buy it and I, was, I went and did a podcast while I was in Las Vegas and I was talking about this frustration I had and I said they don't understand the difference between cost and worth. For the love of goodness they could get coached every single day to sell more houses to pick up five or ten more houses to pick up twenty five thousand more dollars a year for six hundred and ninety seven dollars and I was just on this rant on this podcast and the guy I was doing the podcast with was a major salesperson he said well hold on a second coach who is explaining the value the difference between the cost and the value to those real estate agents. This is on a live podcast. <laughs> But he was right. He's like, are you not the one explaining the difference between the cost and the value to them? Instead of blaming them for not purchasing it, you should be blaming yourself for doing a pitiful job of explaining it. You were in the picture. Now, here's the deal. He was exactly right. 
his point was if you do a better job of explaining the, the value to them and pitching your services, they would per more people would purchase that online academy. Now, he happens to be my partner in the online academy, so he's a little biased on that. Mm -hmm. but, but, but the reality is he was exactly right. I was complaining they wouldn't purchase it. No different than a, than a loan originator here saying, well, we're losing a bunch of business because of a rate. Okay, we, can't, we, we get this question every day. Well, your rates are higher than other people's rates and this and this. Well, do a better job of explaining the value and the rate won't be such an issue. Everybody understand what I'm saying here? That's the point that he was making is quit, quit taking your ownership and push it on to other people. Take back full responsibility of that value. So, so I tell people all the time, if you haven't purchased something from me, it's not your fault. Whose fault is it? It's my fault because if I did a better job explaining the value, you'd already purchased it. That is total ownership. Everybody see that? Now I'm going to give you one more. This is a tough one. Before I was married, when I was in a long relationship for a couple of years with a person that, that it just wasn't going anywhere. You ever been in a relationship that wasn't going anywhere? And I don't even know why I stayed in that relationship. It, it may be comfort, may be security, but I was dating an older person. She was eight or nine years older than me. And she had been in a very bad marriage. She got divorced. She had no intention of remarrying. I was in my 30s and wanted to get married and have children. So if you were a friend to me, you could, from the outside, look in, say what? Like, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, why are you in this relationship? Why are you dating? She don't want to get married. She's not going to have any more children. You want to get married. You want to have children at some point. What, like, what are you doing? So I just stayed in this relationship. And then I got out of this relationship. And there was one person that I thought, like, that I would end up marrying, okay? Now, in my mind, I was going to end up marrying like a businesswoman, motivation, motivated debutante. You, 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 got it, you got in your mind what I'm talking about here? Like five foot five, blonde hair, packaged up like a little debutante. I mean, in my mind, that's the kind of woman I was supposed to be with. I'm a businessman. I'm looking for a businesswoman. Does that make sense? And that particular businesswoman, I knew exactly who she was. She lived in my city. And we were friends. And I'm like, that's the woman that I'm going to marry right there. That's her. I know. And so, but for some reason, I kept being attracted to my wife. And my wife is a country girl from West Tennessee, Milan, Tennessee. She's not a businesswoman. She's, you understand what I'm saying? And I kept, like my mind was telling me, you should go date that person because that's the person you're supposed to be married to. Why, why are you still moving toward this person? It's like God was just kept moving me toward my wife. You follow what I'm saying? And I could not make sense of this because my mind was telling me, no, you're supposed to be married to a woman that looks like that and does that for a living. Okay, not this. And one night we went to an event and, and my girlfriend, which is now my wife, was there and this other woman was there. And I kept, I was just, I was, I was, I was just confused. And my mind kept telling me, pay attention to that woman and don't pay attention to this woman. Does that make sense? And I did. And I talked to that person and I talked to my who's now my wife and and after we left that event here's what she said so my wife said this is what really sold me on her she said what am I not doing that would cause you to want to look at that other woman like what do I not provide for you that would cause you to even be interested in her <coughs> now I want you to think about that what what do you think most women would have done that night when I paid attention to that other woman what would they have done they would have got mad she didn't get mad. Here's what she said. The only reason you're looking at her is because of something I'm not doing. And I've never forgotten that. Is that extreme ownership? Yes or no? She had every right in the world to blame me. She had every right in the world to get mad at me. Now, you know the end of the story. I ended up marrying my wife. It's the best decision ever made. But at that time, I didn't know that, right? At that time, I was confused about what I should do. But, but there was something about that statement that told me a lot about my wife. She said, I'm willing to fight for our relationship. And I see that woman as a direct threat to our future. Okay, and, and if, you, if there's something I'm not doing that you think I need to be doing, I'm willing to do it. Because I don't want you paying attention to her, I want you paying attention to me. To me, that was one of the most extreme ownership conversations I've ever had with the person. I mean, she was willing to fight for our relationship, what would eventually become our marriage. When she could have that night said, look, I'm done with you. You go be with her. That's what you want to do. 
or she could just beat me up for paying attention to that person, right? I mean, you know, I mean, you never know. Is that extreme ownership or not? Yes or no? And I heard my, one of my buddies, Grant Cardone, said this, and, and I know we're talking about some personal things. I don't want you to be uncomfortable, but he said, if my wife cheated on me, I wouldn't leave her. He said, because she would only cheat on me if I wasn't giving her the attention that she needed. <coughs> he said, that's extreme ownership. You, see, you see, the, see what I'm talking about here? That's extreme ownership. Now, I'm saying all of this, and I don't know how we got into the, the personal stuff, but, <laughs> but it's okay because we're all friends here. And Jack's video in it so we can pump it out to thousands of people. <laughs> but, but, but my point is, as I was thinking about doing this lesson with you, I was thinking about all the examples in my life that I've seen people have extreme ownership. And then I was thinking about all the people that make excuses every day and blame other people and, and project onto other people and make excuses and don't take ownership of what they're doing. I mean, I was thinking about all those cases of what does extreme ownership look like, okay? And how many people wait on somebody else to do something for them. Like they need another person to prompt them, to get them excited. Nothing has to happen for you to do something. No thing has to happen for you to take action on something. No thing has to happen for you to do what you're capable of doing, right? Extreme ownership is, is, early on I heard it taught by Covey as proactive versus reactive. And in essence, when you think about proactiveness, when you think about this concept of proactiveness, here, here's, what I, here's, the, here's what I thought. I am where I am today based on every decision I made up until today. If I don't like where I am today, then I need to find the person who placed me here, which is who? Me. I am where I am today based on every decision I made up until today. I have placed myself exactly where I am today. If I don't like it, I can change it. So the concept at its core of proactiveness is I accept total responsibility for my lot in life. Nobody else placed me here except me, right? That's what a proactive person says. A reactive person says I am where I am today based on what? Based on what other people have done to me. You know, when I grew up, my dad didn't pay attention to me. This didn't happen. I didn't have any money. No, yeah, I didn't go to the best schools. I don't have, like my bosses. You know, it's, it's very easy to find all the things that happen to a person of why they didn't do something, right? And to blame other people on that. But at some point, that, that, that doesn't fly. At some point, we have to take responsibility. So in essence, I place myself exactly where I am. If I don't like it, then it's nobody's fault but my own, okay? Now, I want you thinking about this in the context of work. Because this is where, when I start thinking about the habit of complete ownership... I take complete ownership of my body. I take complete ownership of my mind. I take complete ownership of my heart. I take complete ownership of my spirit. I, take, I will prepare prior to my time at work to come with batteries included. Most people show up at work and they're not prepared. And you look at all the things that you can do and you say, well, why didn't you prepare? Why, why are we so reactive? Right? Like, like with today's technology, why are we so reactive to everything? Why are we so behind? Why are, why did you not come with batteries included today? Like, why are you not prepared to tackle a day? And, and is that okay? Because complete ownership means I take complete ownership of the whole thing. Okay? I take complete ownership of the whole thing. Now, with some of these, ownership is going to come some sacrifice. To take ownership of your body is going to require how you eat. It's going to require exercise. It's going to require doing things you don't want to do. It's going to require getting uncomfortable. Okay? Taking complete ownership of your mind. Is going to require you to, to, to take ownership of your thoughts, to replace negative thoughts with positive thoughts, to replace negative actions with positive actions. It's going to take, it's going to take some work. It's not magically going to happen. We brought a guy in yesterday, a, a real estate guy, and he wanted to do a video to promote me speaking to his real estate team. And we turned that camera on, and man, he just, he just froze up. I mean, I felt sorry for the guy. He was just like, um... And then he turned to me and I just went boom and I said you know how many times you have to practice to be able to do it thousands of times when that camera turns on it's on you understand what I'm saying you can't sit there and think about what you're gonna say I said, here's a problem you showed up and you didn't think about what you were gonna say and then when they turned that camera on you didn't have anything to say right mm -hmm. now here's the problem your real estate agents are gonna see that how do you think they're gonna feel about your leadership when you don't have something valuable to say you see what I'm saying? You look confused. You look dazed. You look confused. You know why? You didn't, look at, no, I didn't, you didn't prepare. You didn't prepare. When I spoke at 10X in front of 10,000 people, the number one thing people said is you were one of the only speakers who prepared for that presentation. Most people got up there and wandered and rambled. And, 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 and how could you get in front of 10,000 people and not think about what you're going to say? 
How could you not have practiced your presentation? Like, I couldn't understand this, right? Only through pure arrogance would you do that. Well, I can just get up there and say whatever I want to. Well, well, what about the people who paid good money to come hear you talk about something? And you rambled on for an hour to an hour and a half about nothing because of who you are. Does that make sense? It, it doesn't matter who you are. What they came for was to hear something that would help them. So I was confused that that would be a compliment. Like you were the only people out of 27 people that actually prepared your presentation. I'm sitting there thinking, why would, you, why would you come into something like this unprepared? Why would a loan originator come into a day without a hit list of people to call on and a farm club of people to work and a top 25? Why would they come into the day and think they're going to grow their business if they just show up and wait on somebody else? Whomever that person is, Dave Ramsey, Mike Hardwick, Matt Clark, whoever to create something for them. Is that ownership? That's not ownership. You understand what I'm saying? Like why would a person come into the day and think those things? I'm, I'm confused, okay? So when you think about extreme ownership, now, is it hard having a conversation? Kevin, is it hard having a conversation with somebody on your team that looks like that? Because I don't know if you, if you notice, if I've gotten older, I've either gotten crankier or less tolerant. <laughs> so when people don't do things they're supposed to do, I, it's not. So, sometimes I just say, man, what is wrong with you? It's not hard. Right? It's not hard. And if they, say, if they say no, so what kind of excuses? Stephanie, what kind of excuses do you hear in a day? So just think about creating some of these, these, these concepts is I hear these same excuses all the time. I'm too busy and I'm like, man, you're doing one or two deals. There ain't no way you're that busy. It'd be different if you're doing 30 deals. I may give you a pass if you're doing 30, but I ain't giving you a pass on one or two. So then I hear this one, I got a time management problem. You know, time management is my issue. No, you have a priority problem. What is the most important thing you need to be doing every day? Generate new business, getting your current clients to the finish line, right? You don't have a time management problem. That's a, that's a myth, you've, that's a lie you've told yourself. That's just an excuse. Uh, this blew up, okay? It did blow up. Uh, does that stop you from active, doing anything else the rest of the day? Things blow up every day. Things happen every day. Your ability to bounce back from these things. Uh, you know, I'm waiting on this to happen. Nothing has to happen, to, nothing has to happen for you to take action on anything. You never let another person stand between you and your destiny. See how all of these, see we've allowed people to, uh, to, to get into this excuse making mode and then they just make excuses like have you called that person back? Well no I haven't. Well, what's stopping you from calling them back, right? Extreme ownership is you show up every day and you take full responsibility when it goes well and when it doesn't go well. That's the concept. But too many leaders allow their people to make excuses, okay? An excuse is just a self-proclaimed opt-out clause, okay? You, you, you knew to do it, you didn't do it, Let's, not, let's just call it what it is, right? You, just, you didn't do what you're supposed to be doing, okay? Uh, this morning when we had traffic problems, I got, I got a couple of people that travel with me, and I'm like, man, did, 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 is, do, is, there a, is there an app called Waze? Does Waze tell you where the traffic is? Yes or no? Can we adjust our, our, our departure time based on if you're looking at traffic, if there's a wreck on 840, do we need to leave 15 minutes early or 15 minutes late? Do, I mean, you know, let's just, just think ahead here. You want, you want me to drive the bus too? You want me to write the books and drive the bus, coach the team, and sell, you, understand, you understand what I'm saying? Like, why do I have all these people on my team if you can't think? Just tell me we need to leave 15 minutes earlier. Te just, just wake up and think. Tell me. You understand what I'm saying? Now, I could do that, but then why would I need them? Do you understand what I'm saying here? So my point is, when you're thinking about this, it's hard to implant this in people because too, too many people think what? Kathy, they think I'm just going to show up at work and do what? I'm just going to wait on something to happen. Work is, work is when you perform. Okay, that's why I plan on Sunday and I come to work on Monday. I would never come into Monday without a plan. Does that make sense? Too many people use Sunday. Listen, God worked six days and took one day off. Most people want to work two days and take four days off, five days off. We create, let's be in a creation mode, okay? First book out of the Bible says what? God did what? He didn't think, he created. He worked. Does that make sense? He worked. He didn't just think. So a lot of people come into Monday and they're just not ready. Now, so ownership of my thoughts looks like this. Between stimulus and response is a space, and in that space lies my ability to choose my response. Anybody know who said that? Anybody know the circumstances of the person that, that, that had it that said it? Victor Frankel. Man's search for meaning. He was in a Nazi prison camp watching all of his friends be killed and they were torturing him and he said between what you do to me and my response to what you do to me is a space and in that space lies my ability to choose my response. You can take away everything from me but what he called his last human freedom which is his freedom to respond to how people treated him. Does that make sense? 
So I want you to think about that, okay? One of my favorite one is, is uh, John Wooden. Don't, we don't whine, we don't complain, we don't make excuses. We don't whine, we don't complain, we don't make excuses. We have a five and a half year old daughter right now and, and I'm constantly telling her that. We don't whine, we don't complain, we don't make excuses. We don't whine, we don't complain, we don't make excuses. How, if you learn that early in life, how valuable would that be? Now think about that. We don't whine, we don't complain, we don't make excuses, okay? I bring two solutions to every problem I find or I create. I control my mental energy and only bring positive energy to other people. How many of you work around a person that when they're with their very presence, sometimes their very presence is a, is, a, is a Debbie Downer, just their very presence. How many people don't? Now, how do you know that without them saying anything? It's a frequency. Now, let me tell you a secret I learned. One of the trends I was seeing coaching, I'm going to say this for more men than women, is that I began to see men that were let's say 40 to 55 years old who were just in a rut. Call it middle, middle age crisis, call it whatever. And they had no fire, they had no drive, they had no energy, they had no vigor, they had no excitement, they had no enthusiasm, they basically just, right? And I started going out to Houston, Texas to the Hotze Health and Wellness Center because I was coaching this famous doctor out there in Houston. And one day he sat down and explained to me, he said, man, as you age, your body naturally begins to decline. It, it quits producing things that it needs to be successful. Okay, things that create drive and intensity, like testosterone, <coughs> like uh, um, thyroid, like this. And he's like, man, this is why men do not have any drive. They don't want to go do anything because their body's not producing. He said, you could try to motivate them every single day, but if, they're, if their levels are not correct, they're going to walk around like they're in a depressed state. And I said, man, that's exactly what I'm seeing. I'm seeing a bunch of men walking around with no drive, no energy, no enthusiasm, no nothing. And he's like, man, it, it, I'm telling you, it's not the mental part you're talking about. It's the physical part. They're physically not producing what they need to produce. I just thought they were lazy. I'm like, come on, man, suck it up. Let's go do something, right? Uh, only for me to go through it and find out that I was low on almost all of those things. And I was thinking, man, I, there's no way I'm low on energy. But I was. I was low on thyroid, low on testosterone, low on all those things. So what they do is they compound these supplements before you start taking these supplements. And then what are you ready to do? Go, go, go change the world, right? You got a little bit more drive and you get it up, okay? So, here, so my point to you is when you're thinking about these things, uh, the mental energy a lot of people bring to the table is flat. It's flat. It's like flat energy. It's like, come on, let's go. Let's do something. I'm, I mean, get out of this bored, stuck state, right? Get into an excited state. Get into a, let's bring some energy to the state, okay? Um, I'll grow higher, higher awareness of, of how my physical energy affects other people, okay? I want you to think about that right now, how your physical energy affects other people. Take ownership of that, okay? If you're constantly in a bad mood, bring a bunch of low energy to the equation, Okay, I want, you, I want you just thinking about that, okay? So here's the elimination piece, and I'm going to let you talk to each other for just a second. I will eliminate complaining, whining, or making excuses. The habit of this, I, I will eliminate, I don't whine, I don't complain, I don't make excuses. I'll change how I see other people, remove judgment from my system. Here's one thing I've had to understand. Not everybody operates with, some people operate on two cylinders, some people operate on four, some people operate on six, some people operate on ten. If I want something for a person but they don't want it, I can push them real hard, but, but at the end of the day, you understand what I'm saying? They don't want it for themselves. It's like you want it more than they want it for themselves, right? I'll embrace compassion. So how do you do these at the same time? We do try to understand, like, how do I understand, like, what's going th through their brain? Where are they on the food chain? What's happening to them? I value the heart and contribution of other people. Now, when you're thinking about this, you're saying, how can you be hardcore? How can you be hardcore and have compassion at the same time? I call it intense and positive. How do you be intense with people, but you be positive with people? You don't have to call them names. You don't have to make it personal. You don't have to be negative. You can be very intense with people, but you can be positive with people. Like, man, I expect a lot out of you, okay? I have high expectations for you. I see you doing bigger things in the world. I want to push and challenge you to a higher frequency, okay? So I want to stop right there. And as it, as it re relates to extreme ownership of your division of your company, where do you feel like you fall off the wagon? Okay, on the sales side, here's what I'll tell you. I think too many people fall off the wagon on generating leads. 
In my opinion, it's nobody else's responsibility to generate leads for a salesperson except themselves. Now, if somebody gives you leads, accept those as bonus leads. Be thankful for those leads, especially if you didn't pay for them. Okay, those are gifts. But in my opinion, here's my one rule, never allow another person to stand between me and my destiny. Okay, so, so what does that mean? That means every day I'm trying to create new opportunity. I'm not waiting on opportunity to happen to me. I'm trying to create that opportunity. Okay, I believe in going seven touches in the follow-up. I believe in 5.7 referrals out of every transaction you do. Follow what I'm saying? I think 67% of people use the first person that contacts them, and the average person is going to buy four to six houses in their lifetime. Why wouldn't we just get all of them, right? Why wouldn't we engage with them, okay? Now, let's take that one I heard yesterday, because some of the people uh, from Churchill were on my accountability session, and I said, give me the biggest objection you get. What do you think they said? Price, Price rate. If, if you hear that objection over and over and over and over, if I'm taking total ownership, what, what should I do? Okay, I look at my price, <laughs> look at it, <laughs> and, and if you're going to hold, if you're going to hold on your position, you need to get better at explaining the value, right? Or add value. Listen, I got another mortgage originator that does probably 50 million a year, he's, he's higher than you. He's higher than you. He ain't coming down on that price. What's he going to do? He's going to try to create more value. Okay, Here, here's what I said yesterday. How, if I'm talking about price, here's what I say to people. Do you spend more money on value out in the marketplace every week, yes or no? Do you eat at restaurants that are better than other restaurants that pay more money for it, yes or no? Yeah, okay, so, so, so price is only a problem in the absence of value. Price only becomes an issue. Price is a proxy for premium in most situations, yes or no? Price is typically indicative of a premium service. We got a new little restaurant in Murfreesboro called Dallas and Jane's, and it's this cool little dude in Murfreesboro named Alex Blue, and he's got all these new things. And, and, the, and the first objection people in Murfreesboro has, oh my gosh, nobody's ever going to pay $42 in Murfreesboro. Some people won't pay, here's what I told him, some people won't pay $42 in Murfreesboro, but some people will. It's up to you to articulate the value of why they should pay $42 in Murfreesboro versus listen to people who would never pay $42. Okay, listen, you can dine on 99 cent hamburgers at McDonald's, you can dine on filet mignon steak, but you typically always get what you pay for. So if I'm a mortgage originator and I constantly hear price, you know what I'm going to practice on every day? How do I overcome that objection? How many different ways can I hit a person when they do that? Those are some of the ways I use. Do you believe price is a proxy for premium many times? I ask people that. Don't you typically get better service when you, when you pay more money for it? Yes. And break it down. Are we talking about four, the difference between 400 bucks? Are we talking about the difference between 500 bucks? I mean, what's the difference? What is the actual difference? I think I've told you this. My banker charges me 5.5% on most real estate deals I do. I know I could get it for five. You understand what I'm saying? He's worth the extra money, okay? Because he's a better banker, okay? So, so my point is, and, and my point is, this, this is an excuse of a lot told, well, we can't get to business because our, our rates are too high. No, you haven't done a good job of what? Explaining the value, okay? And we get better explaining the value, don't matter what the price is. Y'all see me use the example about Nick Saban? It don't matter what they pay Nick Saban if they make $100 million off of him a year, okay? It don't matter, okay? So what I say is, look, you're focused on the wrong number here. You're focused on the wrong thing. What you ought to be focused on is what kind of, what kind of service we're gonna provide for you at that price, okay? So take a second right now and talk to the person beside you and say, these are the areas that I feel like We've gotten lax as it relates to extreme ownership. What are the areas you think you've gotten lax as it relates to extreme ownership in your division? Okay, take a second and talk about that. All right, let me ask you what, do you, what are you coming up with so far? Well, when you go back to this one, I want to show you something. We did a session earlier in the year on confusion. And confusion is a problem that appears to have no immediate solution to it. What I find out is if you are not crystal clear on what exactly what it is you want, and who's supposed to do what, and remind them every day of that, then people will not do it. The, the second you assume is, is the second you made a mistake as a leader. Okay? We were doing some training in our office on a new system that we use, and my accountant was training people, but she wasn't testing them. She was exposing them to how to do it right. 
So I'd go out on the road and had to do with how we took book orders and signed people up. We'd get out on the road and it was just a big mess. Nobody knew how to use the system correctly. We couldn't take credit cards right. And I would call back and get on to her and I'd be like, what? How many times you, right? Then I realized you ain't testing these people. So when they get in, when they get in pressure situations, they can't handle it. And a pressure situation is I speak and a hundred people come straight to the table to buy a book at one time. And there's three people back there trying to take orders. And people are right there just on them, on them. They're trying to run credit cards, but they don't, know how, they don't have mastery of the system. I, she's like, I trained them, I trained them, I trained them. I said, no, you didn't test them. Testing them is throwing things at them to see if they can handle what you trained them on. They have been trained, but they haven't been tested. So I'd get out on the job site and there'd be confusion. I'm like, why? And I'm sitting there going, why don't this work? I thought you'd been trained on this. <coughs> well, I have been, but I don't understand this one thing. And this is, well, you haven't been tested on it. So confusion is created. So, so I said, hey, that's our fault. I'm not getting mad at the, little, the workers. I'm saying that's our fault because we haven't tested you properly on this. You don't know how to handle that. So let's go back to the objection piece. If you're getting, if you're getting constantly pushed on for rate, you should be in a room every day practicing how to overcome that objection. Let me give you an objection and tell me how you're going to handle it and practice it and role play it and work on it. If a professional salesperson is practicing how they overcome, they're using five steps for overcoming an objection if you get the same objection every single day. Does that make sense? That's and let, me test, let, me, let me give you an objection. Let me see if you can handle it. Okay? That's testing people. Let me throw this objection at you. That's, te that's more ownership. Okay, now we're really getting down. Not just say, well, our rate's higher, so we're not, you know, we can't get a loan closed because our rates are higher, and that's somebody else's fault. They, you know, if they lower our rate, we get some, we'd sell some more loans, okay, whatever the case may be. So, so that's a confusion. So a problem that appears to have no immediate solution, and typically it's just not clear. It's not clear on what people are supposed to do. Who creates that confusion? Typically we do, the leaders, right? We're not training and we're not testing people. We're not training and we're not testing people. It's not repetitious, okay? All right, so, get, so that's one. So you walked in and instead of getting mad at them, it's not going the way it's supposed to. That's not your fault. Whose fault is it? It's my fault for not making it clear. It's not your fault, it's my fault. If I'd done a better job explaining it to you, you wouldn't go, right? If we'd done a better job of testing our people, they wouldn't go out there and screw it up on the job site. It ain't their fault, it ain't your fault. I tell them, it ain't your fault, it's my fault. Okay, this morning when it comes to the ways deal, it ain't, it ain't your fault, it's my fault for not telling you to think like this. It's not telling you to check the traffic before we get going. Okay, now, now I've told you, now you know how to do it, right? So, so, so my point is when you're thinking about these things, the breakdown of ownership is we just pass it on to somebody else. It's somebody else's responsibility. It's somebody else's deal. It's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. Because it's somebody else's fault, we don't take ownership of it, okay? All right, give me another one. Dan, what about you? What did you come up with? Now, how many times have you rolled out something new only to think you're doing a, a, a service to the employees, but it, it isn't clearly explained how to use it, then they don't use it, then you get mad about it, then you say, well, we're not using it. Well, we're giving you everything you can to be successful, right? Why aren't you using all these things? <coughs> well, we haven't really explained how to use these things. We haven't taught people how to use these things, right? There's, so there's even more confusion, okay? And there's no clear expectation, okay? Now, I want to tell you what I did in my office. I set time expectations for my people. For example, people on my team should be watching their online academy three days a week. Three segments. That's no longer than 15 minutes. If you work for me, this is an expectation. I get a report every week, okay? And if you don't watch this online academy, I'm going to dock your pay. This is part of your responsibility to work here. Everybody understand that? We're going to train at 8.30 in the, in the morning. If I can't train you at 8.30, I'm going to call in and we're going to train before then. At 9 a.m., my salespeople should be doing nothing but making outbound phone calls, trying to close deals from 9 to 11. Okay? The operations people can be solving operations problems all day long. But my operations people are on the online academy watching what part of the online academy? The operations part. You understand what I'm saying here? They're watching operations coaching because they should be getting better too. So from 9 to 11, we prospect, break for lunch, then we come back and solve problems in the afternoon. Now, the reason I did that is because I wanted to eliminate confusion. And instead of just letting people decide what they were going to do, I said, let me just clear this up for you. This is what we're going to do. Right? So if I catch you at 10.30 doing something you shouldn't be doing, you know what I'm going to say? Why are you doing that? Do you not understand what we're supposed to be doing here? Because from 9 to 11, the only thing you should be doing is this. Okay? Do we understand? We're on the same page with each other, right? Now, the reason I do that is because if I leave it up to them, 
to me, that ain't taking ownership of what I'm supposed to be doing. I have made a priority on new money. That means every day we're going to be focused on new money for two hours a day, minimum. Okay? If I was running a mortgage company for two hours a day minimum, everybody in my branch would be doing nothing but prospecting. That means we're not dealing with anything that occurred in the past. Now, that is, I run my little Coach Burt mortgage company because I made a decision that new money is vital to the future of your business. Everybody follow what I'm saying here? I believe training is something you do that should be doing every day, not something you do once a month. And if, and if we, there's certain issues we need to be training on, okay? This morning I was training my guy on tagging, how to tag people. I'm like, here's what's happening. You're selling people, you're turning as a sale, but you're not seeing it through till we have a contract. Do you not understand how to do it? You need to tag them right up to the point. So how do you tag a person? You say, we got a training coming up on Thursday. We can't get you in there until you sign the contract. Does that make sense? Then I gave him a little bit of coaching because I noticed he needed some coaching in that area. I'm like, look, you're turning sales in, but they're not sales. They're not sales until we have a contract. Okay, so you're not going to get a commission check until you get this sale, and you ain't going to get this sale until you, you understand what I'm saying? So I'm just coaching him on how to do that, and I just call it tag him. You tag him right up into the point we have the contract. That's 15 minutes of coaching, okay? So when you're thinking about this from an operational standpoint, this extreme ownership a, a lot of times starts because we, there's some confusion about what people should be doing, typically a time confusion, right? It's like I'm, and then they'll call it time management. I got a time management problem. So, so here's what I would say. Do you map out your days before you show up at work? Because if you don't, that's our first problem. When you show up at work, we're ready to go. We're not trying to figure out what's going on. We're already ready once we get here. Okay? And this could be true in operations, too. In operations, we come in, we got our files, we start from the, from the end, and we work backward to that end. We communicate like crazy throughout the process. Right? Let's eliminate any confusion there. Grant, what did you come up with? Well, let me ask you this. If you get complaints, and you do, has every person been trained in how to overcome, how to handle a complaint. Because this is very important. I use a formula when I get complaints. I listen, I acknowledge, I isolate, I validate, and if it's, a, if it's a complaint that I think is a bogus complaint, then I reframe the person. Hey, so-and-so said they're going to call us back and they didn't do it. You're right. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Okay? Is there any other reason that you're upset besides this one thing? No, it's just this one thing. Okay, if we did a better job calling you back, would, would that help you? Because you're right, we can do much better on that. Okay? That well, let me ask you a question. Do, do you think there's any change in behavior if there's no, if there's no consequence? Mm -hmm. Now, if you got kids, you understand this, right? Mm -hmm. Kids will not change their behavior without a consequence. As long as you keep letting them do what they want to do, they'll keep doing it. But here's the deal. Employees will do the same thing. If you say be here at, at a certain time in the morning and they show up late every day and you continue to let them do it, they'll continue to do it until you say, look, this ain't happening again. You understand what I'm telling you? Okay, I'm telling you, my own employees, I run a motivation business. My own employees test me on these things. When I'm, I'm out there preaching this stuff and I'm like, I'm not being a hypocrite. Okay, we're going to practice what I go out there and tell other people to do. You understand what I'm saying? If I say we're going to prospect for two hours a day and I'm telling everybody I coach, then by God, we're going to prospect for two hours a day. It ain't an hour and a half. It ain't an hour. That makes sense? Okay? If I'm telling people to be positive on the phone and I hear you be negative on the phone, I, I'm going to correct that behavior. And I say, look, because I'm not being hypocritical. We're going to do what we're telling other people to do. Right? So I guess my point is when it comes to this extreme ownership, this is the part of management that ain't fun. Would you agree? It's just the part that ain't fun, but it's the necessary part of, of coaching people and holding people accountable to what they're supposed to do, okay? And that's, that's just a part of it, man. You know, as from a coaching background, I would never wait six months in a, as a coach to have, a, have a, a meeting with a person if they were underperforming, you know? I would just uh, tackle that right then. Like, like, right? like, like right now, we need to address this because it's going to cost us winning in the future, okay? I wouldn't wait six months to a performance review to tell them that they were bad for six months, okay? I would just give them feedback. Sometimes they don't like that feedback, but sometimes that's what they need. I guess what I'm saying is where there's no consequence, there's no change of behavior. Now, you would think if it's a loan originator who's not making any money, there's enough consequence. The market's going to discipline them. They're not making any money, right? But even for some people, that ain't enough consequence. I'm like, being broke ain't enough consequence for you, okay? But, but apparently it's not because you still won't prospect like you're supposed to every day. You understand what I mean? So money's coming from somewhere, right? <laughs> I don't know where it's coming from, but, but you're going to have to make some money somewhere, and you're only going to make money when you sell something. So I need you to do this. Not for me, right? For you.
Okay? Now, let's close it out with this. Uh, Jocko Willick, the book Extreme Ownership is a good book. I, I think it's, it really gets you in the mindset of no matter what problem you're facing in the world, there's a good chance you help create that problem. Right? Like no matter what adversity, when we face adversity, there's a reason many times we, we had a hand in creating that adversity. We didn't do something. We did do something we shouldn't have done. You understand what I mean? And, it, and extreme ownership is just saying, you know what? It's, you're right. It's my fault. Nobody else's fault but my own. My team's not performing like they should. It's my fault. That's what you need to try to deliver. And if you don't deliver it, there, there needs to say, hey, we didn't do it the way we, we were supposed to do it for whatever reason, okay? So take this, guys. Take this habit. And it is a habit. It's so easy, man. Things go wrong to find somebody. The first word out of your mouth is find somebody to, to blame. So e that's, the easy, that's the easy route. Okay, total ownership is, hey, it's on me. I watch these NFL documentaries. Uh, I've gotten, they're called All or Nothing, and they travel with an NFL team for a year. And it's interesting to me how those coaches coach those players. When they make a mistake, even when the players didn't perform and they're getting paid to perform, they walk in there and the head coaches take responsibility for that. I mean, it's really interesting. I expect them to go in after the game when people are getting paid millions of dollars Say, look, we're paying you six million dollars to to run the football. Most of those coaches that are making big money walk in and say, look, it's my fault. My fault we lost tonight. My fault we didn't win. My fault we wasn't prepared. We'll do better. You understand what I'm saying? It's like I they, they, it's opposite of what I expected. I expect them to go and blame everybody, throw things, kick things. They don't. They just walk in and say, look, we got beat. It's nobody's fault but mine and my coaching staff. We'll get better. It's a real interesting dynamic because that's not how most people operate. It's always somebody else's fault. You understand what I mean? So this is extreme ownership at the highest level, okay? All right, guys. Thank you very much. Have a great day.